Welcome to church. Hey. All right. So this morning, um, we are going to be continuing our series in James called Steadfast. And today we're going to be looking at chapter two and having a, um, a look at the connection between faith and works. Luke's going to be bringing that message to us shortly. Um, right now, we're going to stand and sing. Please join us and we'll lift our voices to the Lord, guys.
Hello everyone, my name is Jess, I'm the children's minister here at St Luke's. I apologise if my voice is a little croaky, I did a lot of yelling at the TV last night, as I'm sure some of you guys did too, I bit all my nails off in nerve, right? but I'm not here to talk about the Matildas and how amazing they are, I'm here to talk about Kerry. Uh, so can you make Kerry feel welcome please? Uh, so Kerry became a scripture teacher this year. Uh, and I want to hear about how it's going for you. So why did you think it was a good idea to become a scripture teacher? Uh, okay, so at the beginning of this year, there were a lot of notices in the newsletter saying we need scripture teachers, and it seemed to be getting a few more exclamation points as the year was actually starting. And I was ignoring the call, but I basically ended up, I think, just right before term started jumping on because I actually love the idea of teaching and I love being around kids and I love being in a school setting. And so I thought, okay, the best part about that is then I actually can speak about faith mm. and be open about it. And so this is a great opportunity to use something that I kind of like doing and get involved. Excellent. What has been uh, a great moment for you this year with your class? Okay, so there's a couple. So, you know, kids can get chatty and they get a little bit fidgety. So I love the power of a minute silence. So there's nothing like it to have a whole load of kids competing against each other to be silent for a minute. <laughs> and you basically stand there going, oh, yeah, this is good. <laughs> have a bit of a moment of prayer, clear your head. And then, um, but apart from that, I've got a class that's, I think it's 21 kids and just under half of those are going to church, so the other ones aren't, so I assume they're not going to church. Um, and to have one of those kids, you know, you're teaching the word parables to them, that is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Um, and one week it's like, does anyone know what parables are? And you can see this kid puts his hand up and he's like, mm, okay. I can see you're really having a good, it's an earth earthly story with a heavenly meaning that's it you got it and then the next week you're saying parables does anyone remember and he sticks his hand up like, earthly story with a heavenly meaning and you're like hallelujah amen <laughs> yes so those moments yeah they're pretty gold excellent excellent uh kerry is also a chaplain in one of our local schools yowie bay uh yowie bay has had our kids hope program uh running in it for over 10 years now um, as the chaplain, what is the difference between chaplaincy and Kids Hope? Yeah, there's um, quite a difference because I think we can imagine and say, well, you know, if there is a chaplain in a school, why do we need Kids Hope people in there as well? Um, because the chaplain is caring for the kids, the teachers, the parents, the families in two days. So you're not going to get around and spend a lot of time. So the difference is, is that Kids Hope mentors get to make a relationship with a child that is enduring and is stable and happens every week. And so that is, I think, the major difference between the two. Yeah, wonderful. For those that don't know, Kids Hope is a mentoring program that we run from our church into two of our local schools uh, where you get to go into school and you have one kid for one hour every week. Um, so do these kids benefit from this Kids Hope program? Absolutely. So I've been a chaplain in this school for seven years now and I've watched... There's no, no joy greater than walking past a mentor with their child playing basketball or they're sitting having a game or they're helping them with homework or they're reading or they're doing... And you can just see that the child is completely safe, secure and loving this space. So yes, there are children that I have seen benefit from this program directly. Um, I think we have children who have accessed church because of the program. Um, but generally speaking, they're getting a great example um, of faith, of care, of kindness, of all the fruits, basically. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, what benefit uh, does the school get from the program? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one because um, like our, I can speak for Yowie Bay and they, a lot of our executive or leadership aren't really, they don't have uh, faith base and they're not interested. And so the fact that we have a chaplain, SRE and Kids Hope is a massive blessing to be able to pursue those opportunities. And I said to my um, principal, I said, oh, look, it's, there's a chance that 
Kids Hope might not continue at this school. We're not sure about whether we'll be able to get mentors. We're not sure whether we'll be able to do this. And they were disappointed, like so disappointed. So this week I said, I'm getting up at church Hmm. to ask if people would consider thinking about mentoring kids once a week for one hour. Um, And the reaction is huge. Like, this is brilliant. Um, Teachers have a lot going on for them in their schools. So the kids that are struggling or they're not always struggling, it's just need some support from an adult and they can't do one-on-one with all the kids in their class. And so it's selecting those kids that could really benefit from that one-on-one. Yeah, excellent. So we need more Kids Hope mentors. Uh, Kids Hope is such a valuable community-based program uh, where we as a church get to provide support and love, and not just our love, but the love of Jesus uh, to the community around us. Uh, And that one hour of the week that we provide those kids could be the most important hour of that kid's life. Uh, So if you are interested in becoming a Kids Hope Mentor, mentor, please come and talk to me after the service. Uh, It's one hour a week um, and it requires you to love Jesus. Um, So come and talk to me afterwards. I'm going to pray for Kerry right now uh, and our Kids Hope and our scripture program. So let's pray. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for uh, the incredible opportunity we have to share the love of Jesus uh, with kids in our local schools. Thank you for our amazing scripture teachers and our Kids Hope mentors Uh, that they give their time to see these kids teaching your word uh, and providing love and support to vulnerable children. Please, Lord, we need more of these incredible people. I pray that this ministry would touch the hearts uh, of the people here today and that we can reach more and more kids with your love and salvation. Uh, I pray for Kerry as she ministers to the Yowie Bay community with her knowledge and her big heart for loving the vulnerable. Give her energy and patience as she witnesses to the staff and the families at Yowie Bay and as she shares her faith uh, and your word with the kids at Miranda North. Thank you for her wisdom, her kindness and her selflessness. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. We're going to have our Bible reading from Brittany now. Good morning. Our Bible reading today is from James 2, 14 to 26, and that's on page 1,722. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Thanks, Brittany. Hey everyone, uh, it is good to be with you this morning. My name is Luke, I'm one of the pastors here at St. Luke's and I am looking forward to unpacking James, this spicy passage with you this morning. Um, please do have James 2, 14 to 26 open, it's on page 1722 uh, and we'll keep referring back to it uh, throughout this talk. But before we go any further, uh, please pray with me if you'd like to. Father, thank you that you have spoken to us uh, in your word. Uh, By your spirit, please help us to understand it, believe it, 
And please do make us more like your son, Jesus. Amen. Uh, I'd say that I'm a pretty uh, aspirational, uh, optimistic person. I like to uh, dream big, think that things will be better or will get better, and then work towards that. And yet time and time again, I find that it is easy for me to think or believe one thing and yet do another. I find it easy to think one thing and yet do another thing. And here's a trivial example. My wife, Nicole, thinks I have a problem with being optimistic when it comes to what time I set my alarm for. It's not uncommon for the following conversation to take place between Nicole and I as we are getting ready for sleep. Nicole will ask me, what time is your alarm set for in the morning? I will reply, six o'clock. Nicole will reply, good luck with that. Enjoy waking up at seven. <laughs> it's kind of this like reverse psychology situation where she's like, I'm going to prove you wrong. I reckon she's right about 20% of the time. Uh, when I'm setting my alarm, I'm thinking about my day tomorrow and present me decides that future me would love to get up at 6 a.m. And yet, in that moment, the next morning, as the harsh alarm of my phone shocks me out of my coma, faced with the cold air beyond the doona, I sometimes reconsider my options. <laughs> the night before I say one thing, yet in the morning I do something else. And that's a silly example. Real, <laughs> but silly. Sometimes we can think or say one thing, yet do another thing. We can say that, uh, yes, God calls us to care for his creation, and yet we walk past rubbish. We can say that we are sorry, yet continue to do what we are actually really not sorry for. We can say that we are to love others, yet harbor bitterness towards them in our hearts. Sometimes we can think or say one thing, yet do another thing. We can separate our, our thoughts, our beliefs, and our actions. And that's the tension, the problem that James is wrestling with in today's passage. Please read verse 14 with me. Let's read verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? All right, that's, that's the question that James is asking. Why is James asking this question? Well, the audience of this letter are Christians who are uprooted and unsettled, scattered among nations that do not look kindly on them for following Jesus. Christians who are displaced, weary, and burdened, surrounded by many needs of various kinds. Last week we heard that in James 2, 1 to 13, the, the section that comes just before this, James commands these Christians to not show favoritism towards the rich, but instead to show mercy towards the poor. These dispersed Christians are struggling to practically love those in their midst. And the nature of this struggle is that under the stress and the strain of this situation, these Christians have separated their words from their actions. And so into this situation, James asks, what good is it if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? That's the question. To help his readers process this question, James shares an illustration. Please read with me verses 15 and 16. Verse 15. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? Uh, come with me, think back to the last time you were hungry. Like, really hungry. Like, stomach rumbling, system shutting down, don't talk to me until I am fed hungry. Now imagine that in that moment, you tell a friend just how hungry you are, and as you share this, you are sitting at a table and in front of them, they have this beautiful, huge, juicy burger. And right next to that burger is a knife that is primed to cut that bad boy in half. And what do they do? After taking a bite, with food still in their mouth, they say, oh, I'm sorry, that sucks, good luck. 
that is useless. Words don't fill stomachs. Food does. So how does it help someone who is unable to keep warm and is unable to afford food to tell them be well fed and be warm? It doesn't. What good is it to tell someone to be well fed, faith, without giving them food, action? No good. What good are words without action? No good. And so we read the answer to James's question in verse 17. Please read verse 17 with me. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. James's conclusion is that faith without action is dead. Uh, in this illustration, what is God's call on a person who claims to have faith? This is what the Bible says, three verses, three passages rather. Leviticus 19. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Psalm 82. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Lastly, 1 John 3. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. In this illustration, faith in action would look like physically caring for the needs of this brother or sister. But these Christians have fallen into the trap of separating their faith from their actions. They have disconnected faith and actions, and so now, verse 17, this faith is dead, useless, ineffectual, hollow, faithless. And for James, this is not just an issue of failing to care for the poor. No, this goes deeper because this is an issue of salvation. Notice that in James's original question in verse 14, there are actually two questions. The first is, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? The answer is useless. The second question is, can such faith save them? Can such faith save them? Again, this is not a surface level issue of being a bad neighbor. No, this is a heaven or hell issue. This is a life or death issue. This is a do you really follow Jesus issue. Can faith without action save them? James's answer is no, it can't. Why? Because faith without action is no faith at all and so unable to save. Faith without action is dead. Now, those are some strong words. And so James, in his letter, anticipates an objection from the Christians that he is writing to. Please read verse 18 with me. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Now, I must confess, every time I read that this week, I was confused. Who is saying what? So to help all of us, I'm going to explain it. The Christians that James is speaking to claim they have faith. They are the you, and James, the I, has deeds. So it's like me saying, but you will say that you have faith and I have deeds. I hope that makes sense. And so the objection is, we have faith in Jesus, and that's all we need. To which we, Miranda, in 2023, say, yes, faith alone. But what does James say? He replies, okay, show me your faith without deeds. Show me your faith in Jesus without doing anything. Imagine there's a chair next to me. And I was practicing this, I would have had a chair next to me, but oh well. It's like me saying, show me that you have faith 
that this chair will support your weight without you sitting in it. You can't. It's an impossible challenge. You can say that you have faith that this chair will support you, but without sitting in it, you can't show me. Likewise, these Christians can say that they have faith in Jesus, but without action, without the fruit of that in their life, they can't show James. They cannot show their faith without deeds. Instead, James says that it is by his deeds that he will show his faith. It is by what James does that he will show these Christians that he has faith in Jesus. Because it is by someone's actions that you can tell what or who their faith is in. It is by someone's actions that you can tell what or who their faith is in. To make this point, James asks these Christians to consider Abraham. Uh, In Genesis 22, we read that God commanded Abraham to take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. What did Abraham do? He set off with his only son Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. And as the two of them approached the altar, Isaac asked his father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? This is Abraham's reply. Genesis 22 verse 8. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. A few verses later, as Abraham, with a knife in his hand, is poised to sacrifice his son, an angel of the Lord calls out, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, Abraham replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Because you have not withheld me from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now I know that you fear God. Faith in action. Please read James 21 to 22 with me. Was not our our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. To be righteous is to be right with God. Uh, Because of our sin, our rejection and rebellion against God, we are not right with God. Abraham But these verses are not suggesting that Abraham made himself right with God. Abraham did not do something and was then declared righteous. No, it's the the other way around. Abraham had faith in God and so in faith acted, proving that his faith was genuine. Abraham demonstrated his faith by his deeds and so was considered righteous. Or consider Rahab. Rahab was a Gentile who protected two Israelite spies in a foreign land. In Joshua 2.11, we read that Rahab confesses that the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Rahab believes that God is the one true God, yet that alone is not enough, for even the demons believe that. Verse 18. Verse 19. (laughs) Rather, acting out of faith, Rahab was considered Righteous, James 2, 25. Abraham and Rahab showed their faith by their deeds. Faith in action. And so to the objection that we have faith in Jesus and that's all we need, James says that's not possible because faith without action is dead. Okay. What about our objections? Let's take a moment to clarify what James is not talking about all right james is not saying that we are made right with god because of what we do james is not saying that it is how how good we are or how much we do that makes us right with god ephesians 2 
clearly says that we are dead in our sin and under the just judgment of God. We are God's enemies and there is nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with him. And nothing means nothing. James is not preaching a work yourself to heaven scheme. James is not saying that we are made right with God because of what we do. Nor is James preaching a gospel that requires us to partially contribute to our faith with our good deeds, our works. We aren't topping up our faith with what we do. No. Again, we are completely dead in our sin, hopeless and helpless. James is not saying that we are made right with God because of what we do. Okay. So what about when the Bible speaks about faith alone? Because in Romans 3.28 we read, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Justified by faith apart from the works of the law. How does what James is saying fit with what we read in Romans? I've been wrestling with this question all week. It's a big question. Here are two brief thoughts. And we can talk more if you have questions later. First, I think Romans and James are dealing with different issues. Paul is speaking in Romans to the means by which we are saved, by faith alone. Tick, amen. James is speaking to the genuineness of that faith, true faith, requiring us to act in faith. That's the first thing. Second, I wonder if a reason we trip up on this uh, is that we have misunderstood faith, or we misunderstand faith sometimes. For various reasons, and maybe in reaction to teaching that we can make ourselves right with God, I think sometimes we can silo our faith and detach it from action. So now we think that faith can exist without action, and in doing so, we turn, we accidentally turn faith into this uh, intellectual or heart thing. Faith is over here, necessary, and action is over here, not necessary. We think that faith can exist without action. But James says... The opposite is true. How does faith work without action? The answer, it doesn't. Because faith without action is dead. Because necessary and the very definition of faith is action. Again, let's go back to the chair. I can say that I have faith that this imaginary chair will hold my weight, but that faith is only true faith when I sit in the chair Up until that moment, it is just an intellectual exercise. True faith requires action. It's two sides of the one coin. We can't separate them because our faith without action is dead and therefore it is not actually faith at all. In verse 18, James challenged the Christians to show him their faith without deeds and James would show them his faith by his deeds. For it is by someone's deeds that you can tell who or what their faith is in. And so here's a question that we all need to reflect on and wrestle with this morning. What do my actions reveal my faith is in? What do my actions reveal my faith is in? I imagine that with so many of us uh, in the room... That's a question that will lead to many different answers. For some of us, as you reflect on your answers, this passage is a warning. A warning as to the seriousness of trying to separate faith in Jesus and how you live your life. Do you claim to have faith in Jesus yet sleep with your girlfriend or boyfriend or consume porn? Do you claim to have faith? Faith in Jesus, yet get drunk and lose self-control? 
Do you claim to have faith in Jesus, yet love money and status more than Jesus? And let me please add this nuance here. The issue that James is addressing is not the sin in your life, because Jesus will forgive us for our sin. The problem that James is addressing is being okay with sin in your life, being happy for sin to stay in your life, welcoming sin into your life in these ways, claiming to follow Jesus and actively living as if you don't, claiming to follow Jesus and yet keeping part of your life for yourself. A faith that is separate from action is dead and unable to save. For some of us, as you reflect on your actions, I think you should be encouraged. Not proud, but praising God for the work that he is doing through you. My heart is made so glad by so many of you. Uh, It's a real joy to uh, now live in the Shire and work here day in and day out and to see so many of you putting your faith into action practically caring for the needs of people in our church and community, cooking meals, providing shelter, gifting furniture and appliances, giving up your time to teach scripture and kids hope so that kids in our public schools can hear about Jesus and know the love of Jesus, or simply bringing your family to church to sit under God's word when it is so hard to bring your family to church. That is faith in action. And lastly, for some of us, as you reflect on your actions, what you need to hear, I think, is that Jesus forgives us and repentance is faith in action. If you are under the crushing weight of guilt because of your sin, maybe you haven't been living in a way that, maybe you have been living in a way that tried to separate faith and action, come to Jesus. There is nothing that you can do to make yourself right with God, but there is also nothing that we can do that God is not willing to forgive us for. If you have not repented of your sin, do so. Repentance is faith in action. If you can't grasp the assurance of Jesus' forgiveness for your actions, pray. Prayer is faith in action. Pray that God, by His Spirit, would give you the assurance of Jesus' forgiveness for all your sin. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? It is no good, for faith without action is dead, and so is no faith at all. Instead, James calls us to live a life of active faith, following Jesus. And let's pray that God will help us do so. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we are saved by faith alone. Thank you that it is nothing that we have done or can do, but everything Jesus has done. Having been made alive in Jesus by faith, please help us to live out that faith, true faith, all the days of our lives. Amen. It's a joy that we could come to our Saviour Jesus, so let's stand and sing to him. Of a love, take my 
we've just sung. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. What a great theme for our prayers this morning. And uh, these words are particularly prevalent for those that serve in the missionary field, CMS and other organizations. And this morning we're going to pray particularly for Kylie Zeech at the Johannesburg Bible College uh, in Johannesburg. And uh, we're going to watch a short video now, and uh, then I'll come back and pray. Hello, St. Luke's Miranda. This is Kylie Zeech, um, the Orleans Missionary in South Africa. As you can see, it's very sunny today, um, but it was snowing on Monday. So we're in cold weather, um, but good things have been happening. Um, I just want to say thank you again for your prayer, encouragement, and support. It's nearly coming up on seven years. I've been in Johannesburg, can you believe? And um, God has been so kind. Um, and I thought I'd share a few things. Um, firstly, um, you can thank God for term one and two of the year going so well. We have over 330 students on our three campuses this year. And it's been incredible to see growth and change. I think particularly of Zuza, who um, is at JBC, but also at my church. He had never preached. He'd never got in front of a group um, sharing God's word. And a month ago, he stood up and he um, preached um, Daniel 3 um, to our church. He was faithful and he was passionate. And it really encouraged our congregation seeing a young man um, passionate about God's word. So you can thank God for people like Zuza who are taking what they're learning at JBC and putting it straight into practice. Um, you can thank God for time in Zim. Um, Tully and myself went up and did a conference, um, a biblical counseling conference, um, and it was incredible to see men and women, um, some coming from very traumatic backgrounds, look and see how God 
um, is the ultimate healer and comforter and how his word and his people um, play a role in that. So you can thank God for our time. Um, love you to pray. Um, in August, we have Mission Week at college where we excite our students about going into their local community and teaching and preaching. Um, and we also excite them about the opportunities of them going to other places, particularly in the continent of Africa. Um, so please pray that hearts would be open um, for um, my South African brothers and sisters maybe to go to another African continent, um, not continent, country and share God's word. Um, so pray that, that something moves in their hearts. I'd love you to keep praying for me. Um, it's been a real joy this year of ministry and service, but there's been challenges, um, ups and downs. Um, just keep praying that I can keep trusting and resting in God and his goodness. Um, he is always faithful. And through the downs, we can sometimes forget. So pray that I just keep trusting him in all those things. Um, I'll be coming back to Sydney in November. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all face to face. So thank you for prayers. Um, thank you for your support. And I look forward to seeing you later in the year. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our sister Kylie serving you at the Johannesburg Bible College. Lord, we thank you for her faithfulness over seven years now and her commitment to teaching and preparing students for Christian ministry. Thank you, Lord, that you have blessed that work mightily. As she has shared with us, we particularly pray for Kylie and her involvement in the upcoming Mission Week. Lord, we pray for the students as they are challenged in Scripture teaching and then to go out and to serve in their local community, to share the gospel and to witness to the good news of Jesus. You also pray for Kylie's Bible study and the other Bible studies that she is uh, supervising. Lord, we pray for deep learning and for hearts and minds to be transformed as they journey through James, as we are in this particular uh, church. Lord, we also think of Nonkakla as she furthers her studies at George, Whitfield, George Whitfield College in Cape Town hoping to eventually return to Johannesburg Bible College in a lecturing role. Lord, we know Nonkla Kla has been um, helped and, and nurtured by Kylie, um, but we particularly pray for Nonkla Kla that you would help her in the second semester that's about to begin, that she would be diligently applying her time to her studies, but Lord, mindful of the care of her son that she had to leave behind in Johannesburg. We pray for the students that Kylie comes into contact with and those particularly going through challenging times. We think of Mam Claire, who recently lost her son in a shooting at a church. We pray for the family as they make sense of this, this terrible loss. We pray for Alison and Charlene, good friends of Kylie, who have lost their brother and mother at this time, in this past week, in fact. Dear Heavenly Father, would you comfort and support them and their families at this time? May they find their strength in you. If we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for challenging us this morning on what it is to have a living faith and seeing what faith through action is. Would you remind us that we are saved by grace through the death of our Lord Jesus Christ? And would you challenge us to see our faith expressed in love as a verb, as actions, not mere words? As we declare our faith, would we all be actively living for Jesus by visiting those who are sick in hospital or at home recovering, by caring for those who are anxious or lonely, by supporting those who have lost loved ones, by reaching out to those experiencing economic hardship at this time. So grant us as we leave this place, Heavenly Father, this morning, with knowledge deepened, with love kindled, and with strength to live more nearly as we ought. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, before we sing our last song, uh, just a few moments of what's going on in life around here.
Uh, the first one is that we're a church that loves to pray and give thanks uh, for all that God has done and is doing in our lives and in our world and in our church. Uh, so we're going to meet uh, next Saturday morning, spend some time in prayer and sing a couple songs. Uh, we would love for you to join us. Uh, there's a free breakfast, uh, so do sign up uh, to let us know that you're coming so we can provide breakfast for you. Uh, we all also want to be a church uh, where all people are welcomed and uh, yeah, welcomed into church and cared for. And one of the ways uh, that we're seeking to do that is by our accessibility committee. Uh, and so we would love for you to uh, fill out a survey. Let us know uh, what, uh, how, how well our site is going on this part uh, so that we can help love and serve uh, you, but also the many people who will come to our church who need uh, those accessible things. Um, do fill out a survey. There's paper copies up the back or scan our QR code or, yeah, chat to one of our welcomers. They can help you with that. Uh, coming up in November, it seems like a long, long way away, but Square One is coming up. Uh, it's kids camp. The uh, theme is Transformed by Grace. I kind of wish I could go along. It looks really great. Um, but it's not until November, but uh, tickets go really, really quickly. We would love for you to sign up for that now. Um, we've got some tickets put aside for us, but do uh, head on to our website, scan the QR code, do uh, get some tickets for your kids. It's a great week. Um, yeah, do come along to that. Uh, also, coming out of our Embodied series, uh, last term, seems like it was heaps uh, long away, uh, but uh, one of the questions that came out of it uh, was transgender identity and the church. And So we're going to have uh, Rob Smith, guy uh, who's a lecturer at SMBC. He's recently written a PhD in a book on this topic. Uh, he's going to come up to church, uh, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, uh, and, yeah, talk to us about it, but also give us uh, space to ask some of the questions that we have. Uh, we would love you to come along with your Bible study, uh, not this Tuesday, next Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. up here at church for that. Um, finally, uh, Young and Old's Big Day In is coming up in September, September 9th, all day. It's going to be a really great day uh, of young adults being able to spend time together, uh, spending time thinking about sanctification in the Christian life, thinking about uh, faith and living that faith out in works. Um, there's going to be a whole bunch of games, community. Uh, there's lunch and dinner. It's 30 bucks. We would love for you to sign up and come along to that. Uh, but we're going to stand and sing our final song, so I'm going to invite the band up as a song that uh, calls us and reminds us to uh, ask for God's help in guiding us and leading us as we seek to live out our faith in work. So would you stand and let's sing this together. Though I walk through the valley and I can't see the way shadows surround me I will not be afraid for I know you will with me you will always provide though the path may be lonely you will stay Oh
Okay, so come to the end of our service now, St. Luke's. So um, a couple of things before we finish up. The first one is our Explore Life series. So if you've got questions today or you've been wondering lately a little bit more about um, faith and Jesus, then we've got a series coming up. Um, it's called Explore Life. It goes for five weeks and it they meet on a Monday night at 7 p.m. up in the Fellowship Centre. So if you are if you think maybe that might be good for you or you'd like to go along, then scan the QR code and give us your details. Otherwise, just come and chat to somebody about it and you might be able to go along to that, to that event. The other thing we have is an onboard lunch. So if you're newish around St Luke's um, and would like to get to know a bit more about the church and about the people here, then come along to an onboard lunch. Um, they're on the next one, the 10th of September at 12pm or 7pm. Yes, so if you'd like to come to that, scan the QR code for more details. All right, so um, a big sermon today, very challenging and encouraging both at the same time. I was... Um, I was really encouraged that, well, actually, firstly, I was really challenged um, to think about faith and action together like that, because I know I won't, to pray about this, it won't take me very long to find that sometimes um, faith and my actions don't always look um, or connect to my faith and I can make mistakes. So um, it's challenging, but it's also encouraging to think that if I talk to God about that and pray about it, maybe can make some little changes or think about ways to improve in that. So be encouraged because God loves us even though we do make mistakes and, um, yeah, and that um, by having faith in him, we are saved through our faith. All right, so um, we're going to finish up today. So let's pray and then we'll head out. Loving Father, thank you that you are a God who cares for us, who listens to us, who is always there. Help us this week to think about our faith and our actions um, and help us to, to love you and to love each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.